Welcome to 1983's Star Wars Episode 6 Review and Thoughts, Return of the Jedi. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, we saw that, sadly, the third part of the trilogy is incredibly difficult to get right, something that's been proven a number of times since this came out. No, really, I honestly am going to be... going to try to be fair to this movie. I actually remember this as being way worse than... I thought it was on this viewing, and no, this is not my first viewing since watching the prequels. And yes, when I get to those, I will also try to give them a fair chance. So, I rewatched Empire three days ago, even though I watched it, you know, on the 4th of September when I did the video on it. Once again, loved watching it. So, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for A New Hope or Empire Strikes Back. As soon as I end the review itself, please note, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie, including discussing the ending. Now, the... yeah, so, content warning and or trigger warning, torture, kidnapping, Xenophobia, body horror, yeah, I believe that covers it. So, I, I think most of it is so toned down, I can understand why this is only rated PG. I, today, it would almost definitely be PG-13, and I think there might have been a few things that they would have to cut to get a PG-13, but, yeah. It does make sense. Now, let's see. So, yeah, the movie's rated PG, so is this video. And, like I've hinted at, I am going to talk about some of the material in it that got it the age rating that it got. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual, like clips from the movie, in another tab. I won't mind. I'll know, but, I mean, I won't, I won't know, of course. I'm not spying on you right now. My probe droids in the shop. Yeah. So, I streamed this movie and thus didn't pay extra to watch it, so anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it, what I was expecting, trailers and other marketing, earlier Star Wars movies, spiritual successors or predecessors. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative, negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. So, in a lot of ways, this movie is like episodes 4 and 5, so I'm not going to mention all the things where they're similar. I'm going to talk about the ways that they're different from one another, so that I'm not just repeating myself. And, yeah, in case you haven't already watched this movie, in order to follow this movie's plot, you will need to have watched A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back. Now, like with the the first two, you know, episodes four and five, I watched this, I want to say around the year 1999, and certainly it was, you know, the expectations were, you know, I, I don't think any, anything negative I send this, in this video about this movie is based on me just being so used to movies that were much that were made more recently and thus you know of course they the effects are largely going to be you know 
you can't expect something from 1983 to have the effects of something from like 1997 or whatever. Now, since we're still dealing with Corona, I'm gonna say during this video, it's possible that I will touch my face. I'm gonna assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. So, yeah, the I base this review on the most recently quote unquote fixed one. That's the only one I have access to. You know, the version you should seek out is as close to the theatrical cut as you can get without having to spend an obscene amount of money. I probably watched this movie around a dozen, maybe a little less than a dozen times. And yeah, this is one of those movies I first watched years ago. For many years, I didn't have access to it. Now I have access to it again. That's why I'm doing the video on it now. Otherwise, I would have done it years ago. So, the plot. Following the events of the first two movies, Han Solo is still frozen in carbonite. And in case you're unclear on that, they give you both a visual of that and C-3PO is, you know, kind enough to also say it right after we see, yeah. In Jabba the Hutt's palace, his friends have to try to rescue him. I won't give away exactly how that goes in the view, unless I won't for spoilers first. After that, Luke tries to find a way to defeat Darth Vader and the Emperor that doesn't involve him hurting his own father. And the Empire has built a new Death Star because the writers couldn't think of something to top that as the ultimate weapon, and maybe that means they should have saved it for this movie. Those who say that, you know, oh, they had to come up with something, well, you know, maybe a, a fleet, a series of dogfights, you know, just, I, I believe that that would work much better than the, the, just having another Death Star. And yes, I am aware that originally, you know, George Lucas was originally going to hold off on the Death Star until the third movie in the trilogy, but when he made the first one, he was he didn't really think he was going to get to make more than one and he thought it was such a cool idea that he wanted to put it in the first one fair enough but he did have like 6 years between you know one yeah between between a new hope coming out and this coming out okay obviously they couldn't have spent all okay 3 3 or 4 years he had 3 or 4 years between A New Hope coming out and them needing to have something locked in place as the big bad in this movie, I feel like that might be enough time to come up with something instead of just reusing anyway. IMDb Trivia does point out that the second Death Star is approximately 460% larger than the first one. And, right, and part of why Lucas put the Death Star in New Hope was budget cuts imposed by the studio. And physicists have calculated that while the Death Star design is theoretically possible, it would take too much money, time, and material to be feasible, which is why Republican politicians are already making it a campaign promise. Anyway, can the rebels possibly defeat the Galactic Empire once and for all? So, let's see. I would say that the action scenes in this movie, they come fairly close to the level set by Empire Strikes Back. Same for the adventure aspect. I do wish the movie had more interesting new science sci-fi aspects. Like the first two, the movie can be successfully scary at times. And that brings us to
yeah. Like I said in my videos on the first two movies, I really love both A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. And in my opinion, Empire Strikes Back is the best Star Wars movie. Now, the this has some elements of a mafia movie. And unlike the the Western and the fairy tale, you know, other genres that parts of the first movie, fit, you know, yeah, the, the first two movies fit into, the Mafia movie stuff doesn't mesh that well with the overall Star Wars style. I will say I remembered it as being worse, but I do still think that, yeah, I, I get it. Lucas, in, in part, he wanted to homage the the first two Godfather movies, which were directed by his personal friend. Can't believe I'm blanking on his name. They're some of my favorite movies. I should know this name by heart. It's it's my bad memory. It's not a lack of, of passion for it. But, but yeah, I get that. I just, I feel like he should have realized before you know all those work hours all the passionate talented people who put so much effort in because the mafia like the 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 element of the movie that makes up the mafia stuff you know i'm not surprising anyone by saying that's the job of the hut stuff but it takes up a chunk of the movie. I'm not going to say exactly how much. And while I don't personally think it's overall too much of the movie, which I know some others do, I do think that it's, yeah, it just does not, it doesn't work as well. It doesn't gel like the Western elements, for example, where Han Solo like walked right out of a Western and into Star Wars. And that works without any, yeah. Now, <clears throat> quoting fellow critics here, everything that takes place on the second Death Star is perhaps the greatest storytelling ever to come to film. It's unfortunate that the creativity and character development from The Empire Strikes Back couldn't carry over. And... Yeah, Return of the Jedi wraps up this trilogy with technical wizardry and fun, but opted for safe, crowd-pleasing mundanity instead of creative daring. It could and should have been much more, but ultimately stands as a testament to the complacency that often follows success and foreshadows the overarching creative issues found in Lucas's prequel trilogy. So, this movie was written by George Lucas, who, you know, the other of his work that I know is the rest of the original trilogy, the sequel trilogy, THX 1138 and American Graffiti. It was also written by Lawrence Kasdan, who helped write Empire Strikes Back. And let's see. Yeah, so. The, yeah, IMDb trivia. The screenplay was not finished until rather late in pre-production, well after a production schedule and budget had been created by producer Howard G. Kassangian and director Richard Marquand had been hired, which was unusual for a movie. Instead, the production team relied on Lucas' story and rough draft in order to commence work with the art department. When it came time to formally write a shooting script, Lucas, Lawrence Kasdan, Marquand, and Kasangian spent two weeks in conference discussing ideas. Kasdan used tape transcripts of these meetings to then construct the script. And I think that might also be the source of some problems that... I get it. You know, screenwriting... I have a tiny, tiny bit of experience with it. And I've watched a number of, like videos talking about it it is you like it's hard to overstate how difficult it is it is immensely challenging it can take a ton of time 
so I don't blame them for not having the script done, you know, earlier in the, in the process, but I do think that it led to some of the issues with the movie. And... Yeah, so quoting fellow critic, slower, longer, and less powerful than episodes 4 and 5, Return of the Jedi closes this extraordinary trilogy more with a whimper than a bang. Jedi is downright repetitive. The script descends into soap opera melodrama. And yeah, so I'm just briefly going to quote the IMDb fact. Why didn't Gary Kurtz return as producer as he had with the previous two films? Kurtz has claimed that he and, he and Lucas clashed over how to progress the Star Wars series. Kurtz recalled that after Raiders of the Lost Ark in 1981, Lucas became convinced that audiences, audiences no longer cared about the story. Ouch. That's a serious burn on your own movie, dude. Those are Lucas's words, not mine. I did not say that about an Indiana Jones movie. Anyway. That audiences no longer cared about the story and were simply there for thrills and entertainment and began to deviate from the originally planned plot lines for Return of the Jedi, at which point Kurtz quit the series. Kurtz has also claimed Lucas changed the emphasis from storytelling as a joke, the emphasis from storytelling to prioritizing toy merchandising. Kurtz has expressed his dissatisfaction with Jedi and the Phantom Menace. Kurtz was particularly displeased with Lucas' decisions in Jedi to resurrect the Death Star and to change the plot outline. And that brings us to so the plot twists in this movie. I'm I'm gonna try to stop saying that it was better than I remembered it as being. They do a pretty decent job. Like the the amount the quality and the those two just those two things quite good you know the, there are enough of the there's there are so many plot twists so many surprises that the movie never really becomes stale and predictable and yeah like the the there's at least one twist that's very frustrating. I'll talk about it in the spoiler section. And other, yeah, but other twists are pretty good. Like you, you know, you you didn't see the stuff coming, and they the the twist. The twist works with what has come before and makes the movie better. It's not just that, you know, I'm on the record as saying the twists for the, a twist for the sake of a twist is bad. You should always have a good reason for a twist. It's not, a, a twist isn't a good thing in and of itself. You know, you, you might as well say sugar in food is automatically good. Well, no, I mean, there's a right, there's, there's right foods and wrong foods to add sugar to, and there's right and wrong movies and places in movies to put twists. But yeah, largely this fares well on, on plot twists. So this was directed by Richard Marquand, RIP. I haven't seen anything else that he's directed I'm not sure I've even ever heard of any of his other films. I looked them up. They're not that highly rated on IMDb. Three of them are from after this, so this movie didn't, like, kill his career or anything. He actually kept working up until his death by stroke. He only lived to age 49. I don't love this movie, but he didn't deserve to die that young. I'm not sure anyone does.
now. Yeah, so quoting IMDb trivia here. George Lucas has admitted to being on the set frequently due to director Richard Marquand's relative inexperience with visual effects. Marquand joked, it is rather like trying to direct King Lear with Shakespeare in the next room. And I, again, I think that shows both his inexperience and the fact that, like, he wanted to do one thing and Lucas wanted him to do another. More IMDb trivia. Director Richard Marquand alienated several of the actors and actresses with Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill accusing him of treating them terribly while simultaneously fawning over Harrison Ford's performance. Again, I think that helps explain some of their performances. Apparently, Paul Verhoeven was considered for this, but uh, Steven Spielberg saw the movie called Spetters from 1980, and then he withdrew his recommendation that Verhoeven... <laughs> it would have been pretty wild to see. You know, obviously it's not going to happen today. I'm, I'm pretty sure Verhoeven is still directing movies, but... No way is Disney going to let him anywhere near the production of a movie that they want to be able to sell to a lot of people, including, you know, relatively young people. I haven't watched all Paul Verhoeven's movies. I'm not making excuses, but, you know, I want to say, what was, what was his name again? Kyle... Broflowski. Nope. Another Kyle. Kyle. Yeah, Kyle from Browse Held High did some videos talking about, you know, he was exploring Starship Troopers. He went into detail about Paul Verhoeven, and certainly some of Paul Verhoeven's decisions are really messed up, but I've never been truly bored by one of his movies, and I have watched Hollow Man. I'm not saying the whole movie is, like, perfect or something, and it definitely gets significantly less interesting in the last third or so, but there's interesting ideas in there. You know, he's, he's one of the directors who can make something that will superficially appear to be a crowd-pleasing Hollywood blockbuster, but, like, sprinkle in subversive ideas that really mean, like, I, all, all of his, all of, all of the movies of his that I've seen had something to say, something to, you know, they comment on things. And have interesting things to say. More IMDb trivia. Principal photography was beset with numerous delays and clashes between executive producer George Lucas and director Richard Marquand, with the former wanting to use multiple cameras during each take so he could have more material in the editing room, and the latter wanting only one or two cameras with no fallback option. Filmmakers inadvertently used old film stock that caused many shots to have a bizarre blue tint, which forced Interstellar Light and Magic, or ILM, to fix the color timing on many shots in post-production. At a certain point, Lucas essentially took over the majority of directing duties from Marquand. Again, I think it shows. And apparently David Lynch was like... Like, Luke, George Lucas approached David Lynch, and he said that he had next door to zero interest, which, I mean, he did make Dune, but I guess, yeah, I don't know, something in that piqued his interest that didn't in this. Anyway, 
And David Cronenberg was offered the chance to direct and declined to make Videodrome and the Dead Zone. Now, I don't remember Dead Zone as being an absolutely incredible movie. I, you know, I've never watched a David Cronenberg movie and felt that there was absolutely nothing there. Videodrome is a masterpiece, so it's, I'm really glad he made that. Once again, it would have been interesting to see him make, I mean, there's no way he would have made a movie that didn't, that wasn't at the very least an R rating. Like, on, a, on when he made The Fly, he actually had to cut stuff so that it wouldn't be NC-17. Like, and even as it is, the movie is pushing, like, the, the R rating. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, anyway, moving on. So the first shot, you know, as per usual, we get the opening crawl. And then it pans to the Death Star and a Star Destroyer flying through space towards it. And, yeah, the movie, it, it does a good job of, like, right away getting... The, the opening establishes a couple of things that are going to be very important for later in the movie. And, yeah, you know, the, the fact that we do see the, de the new Death Star very, very early on, and we're told, you know, they're going to be able to complete it fairly soon. And the... Yeah, not long after that, we see Han's friends working on rescuing him. I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but I will say that it fits with what came before. I'm largely happy with how the movie ends. It doesn't resort to Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. And, yeah, I'm, I'm going to quote a fellow critic here. I love how Marquand was able to get three different arcs running concurrently in the final act that culminates in the climax to bring a satisfying conclusion to the saga. Yeah, he did, they did a really great job on that. Now... There are a couple of points in the movie where you lose at least some interest in it. There's a music performance at Jabba's Palace that goes on for entirely too long. Honestly, even a few seconds would have been entirely too long. And I'm not going to go into details. I'm, I'm just going to say the word, the Ewoks. So... You know, if you're familiar with the movie, you know what I'm referring to. If not, yeah. And the, the climax is in some ways underwhelming compared to the first two, albeit it's thematically both appropriate and interesting. Now, overall, I would say most of the movie is good, some of it great. It's not really one of those movies where you can just like fast forward through entire scenes. But the, the stuff that's not amazing is largely worth sitting through to get to the really great stuff. And the, the, the ending of the movie is, yeah, quite, quite, it's, it's, yeah, really, really good worth sitting through the entire movie for at least once. Now, there are some aspects where this movie is a great sequel. It does follow up on what happened in the first two. The first movie establishes Luke as easy to relate to for young people. The second movie underlines that he does need to mature, and he does mature some. And in this, there's further maturing. It's not one of those sequels that pretends that stuff that happened didn't happen 
other than Lucas's retcons. I'm not going to give away what those retcons are, but if you've seen the first two movies, you you know you already know that Empire Strikes Back retcons Darth Vader from the person who killed Luke's father to actually being his father. There are some things in the movie that do a great job in subverting expectations. There's some aspects of the climax, for example, that really subvert expectations. The movie uses the Force quite well. You know, Luke is becoming... You know, he's, he's getting to be better and better at using the Force and uses it a fair bit in this... And it's, there's actually a, a quite clever, they use it to show that he is, he is getting stronger, but he's also struggling to avoid, like, what's the word? You know, we were warned that Jedi may be tempted by the dark side, and... Yeah, you know, he, we see in this movie that he will sometimes rely on dark, on the dark side as a shortcut if, you know, to, to accomplish some things. And it's, it's a good way of showing that he is conflicted between the light side and the dark side. Both Yoda and the Emperor are supposed to be extremely old, and they are played convincingly as being really old. And... Right, so that brings us to the, the, the cast. Mark Hamill playing Luke Skywalker. Let's see. Yeah, one of my fellow critics said that Hamill gives what is immediately recognizable as the most irritating lead performance in a blockbuster film in recent memory. I wouldn't go that far, but yeah, he also gave it a 2 out of 5. Yoda and Obi-Wan tell him that he has to confront Vader now. Some viewers say they were saying that he shouldn't last time, and... He hasn't got any more training from them since. While that is completely accurate, I would hardly say that you can really claim that Luke is the same person as he was before. Besides which, confronting Vader now that he knows that Vader is his father is a hugely different matter from rushing to his friend's aid when he was told by Yoda that if he did that, it could ruin everything. I do think some... A few of the criticisms that I've seen people, you know, yeah, some of the things I've seen people criticize this movie for, I don't think hold up scrutiny. Harrison Ford returns as Han Solo. His edge has been filed away. He's very bland and boring. I don't mind that he needs help, including sometimes from Leia. Thankfully, Leia helping the men has been in this trilogy from the very start. But the fun of Han's character is the edge. Maybe someone making the movie didn't want his character to still have an edge, but at that point, it would have been better to just write him out of the movie entirely. You know, the... The Cosmonaut Variety Hour say that Han should have died at the end of Empire Strikes Back, and... Yeah... I, th I think an, a strong argument could be made that that would be the best, like the most, that, yeah, a, a more satisfying way to treat his character than him in this. And Carrie Fisher, RIP, returns as Leia Organa. She continues to be really badass, although... You know, in parts of this, she's treated very badly. Let's see. 
quoting fellow critic, Another nice characteristic this film had that the, previous, that the two previous did not was the absence of infighting between each of the stars. Gone was the incessant bickering between Carrie Fisher and Harrison Ford. Finally, everyone was on the same page. It was nice to see. And... Anthony Daniels returns as C-3PO, and the IMDb trivia says that, according to Anthony Daniels, it only took him less than 10 minutes to put on the C-3PO outfit, unlike the last two movies, where it took him two hours. So, yeah, that is quite a relief. And, yeah, sadly... Peter Mayhew, Kenny Baker, let's see, oh, yeah, the the two of them are also no longer with us, they give great performances in this, as usual, and Ian McDermott plays the Emperor in this, and he does a, a really great job being, like, he conveys being extremely sinister and evil and Ben Kingsley, David I guess Suchet, Alan Webb and Lindsay Anderson were considered for the role of Ember Palpatine Alan Webb was originally cast when with Ian McDermott being second choice but Webb had to pull out because of his declining health indeed he died during the few weeks of shooting but yeah, McDermott gives an excellent performance. I do think Ben Kingsley could have been great as well. I am not familiar with the other three. Basically, the Emperor, as the Emperor, Ian McDermott, I've, I've, let's see, I think it was like a Japanese stage actor thing to like do this guttural like really project your voice out there which you know it's it's good if you want to make sure that people far away from you can clearly hear what you're saying it's not really something audiences in the west are used to we we audiences in the west are used to so it came it, it was very distinct in this movie and yeah you know it it works like it is one of those things that it's so unusual that we can't help but really notice it. And yeah, he's he's very very like it. They 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 get a balance where like children. I mean, some children probably did maybe do have nightmares about the emperor, but it's not like you know we're not talking like. Cronenberg's The Fly. It's not like completely, you know, but it is sinister enough that adults don't feel like it's a too, like, childish element of the film. And David Prowse, R.I.P., you know, they continue, as, as Darth Vader, they continue to do a really great job with him being sinister and intense. He gets yet another strong introduction. And... And Alec Guinness also returns as Obi-Wan Kenobi, R.I.P. Now... So the, the um, yeah, Jabba the Hutt is legitimately a very impressive puppet. I believe parts are animatronic, 
he looks much more real than the CG version that was inserted into A New Hope. Expressive eyes, a mouth that legitimately looks like it's forming the words we're hearing him say. Arms and hands that are fairly articulate, like they did an incredible job on on him. You know, it's it's the kind of thing that we we kind of take for granted when we see a movie character, you know, open their their mouth and like if the character isn't played by a human being, very likely, or if that human being is under a lot of prosthetics, you know, if, if the mouth movements fit the words that are being said. That's because a lot of effort was put into that. That's not because the this is, you know, a creature that could actually talk in, in real life, you know. And, yeah, a, a lot of puppeteers... Uh, wait, I guess it's not the puppet. Well, yeah, the puppeteers carry out the, the like, active work of making the, the mouth movements fit the words. And the... I forget what they're called, but the people who created, crafted the puppets, which I don't think is the, the same. I don't think those are the same people as the puppeteers. I could be wrong. Anyway, they're all very talented. Those people also work extremely hard to make sure that there is a mecha mechanism that does a decent job of, you know, making... Because it's not enough to just open and close, open and close. That doesn't look like talking to us. You, you know, you have to have more, yeah, the, the you know, lip movements, a tongue, you know, all, all these different things. And they, it's, it's an incredible job. And it really, it, it needed to be because he's, he's a huge threat to a number of good guys in this movie. And... If we look at him and all we see is, like, a, a mass of, like, latex and, you know, we can practically feel the puppeteers there, which, you know, sometimes if, you, if you're watching a bad puppeteering job, then you get this, you know, you, you can tell. It's like, oh, that's, that's not natural. That's not, you know, yeah. So, the following is not verbatim. This is some of what Cosmonaut Variety Hour said in criticizing this movie. I agree with him on a lot of things. I do think he goes a little bit harder on the against this movie than, than I would. Let's go with that. I think that the director just let the actors do their own thing, and that explains why, though Mark Hamill's performance is great, Carrie Fisher's is awkward, and so is Harrison Ford's which compounds the fact that Han Solo is now boring and bland, and the movie would be better if he wasn't in it. Better for his character, too. The movie puts me to sleep because it's just incredibly boring. Other than... Spoiler. When Luke fights the Rancor in the pit under Jabba's palace. No more spoilers. Now... Yeah, so quoting Info Critic, Hamill is not enough of a dramatic actor to carry the plot load here. Harrison Ford is present more in body than in spirit this time, given little to do but react to special effects, and it can't be said that either Carrie Fisher or Billy Dee Williams rise to previous efforts. The old Star Wars gang are back doing what they've done before, but this time with a certain evident boredom. Luke Skywalker, Skywalker is in his prime here, and he had the best character arc out of everyone in this trilogy. Han Solo felt kind of wasted for a good bit, but he was kind of point, pointless, not bad. Doesn't downplay Harrison Ford's acting. Which brings us to the dialogue. There are some really great lines, especially for Han and Luke. Han is cracking jokes a lot, and, like, there are some situations where things look really bad, and Han is, like, typical, you know, that, that kind of really snarky, which is usually pretty funny. Luke exudes confidence, like, you know, he, he talks about how he, as a Jedi, 
is a great threat to you know the the antagonists he encounters and just yeah it's it's really cool to see it it's a huge there's a huge contrast between his confident performance here and you know i mean he was confident in some of a new hope but he certainly started out very whiny and yeah it's it's very very different here some of the lines are kind of corny the amount and quality of memorable and quotable lines not quite as great as in the first two so the cinematography was handled by Alan Hume RIP and Alec Mills who went uncredited now Alan Hume also DP'd these are just movies I know I've seen that he yeah A Fish Called Wanda, The Utah Kill and Octo Kitty and Alec Mills did License to Kill and Lionheart so they are both quite talented and you know they're they're good at capturing action now But yeah, it, the movie makes, the, the camera work makes it fairly easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes. The movie does not have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm. I'm not sure there are really any unnecessary shots. And the editing was handled by Sean Barton. And it's the only thing I seen that he's edited T.M. Christopher who also edited episodes 4 and 5 Dwayne Dunham you know only thing I've seen that he's edited Marsha Lucas who also edited episodes 4 and 5 in American Graffiti and George Lucas who also edited A New yeah, New Hope Empire Strikes Back American Graffiti JJX 1138 and Attack of the Clones. Huh, I forgot about that. The editing keeps it easy to follow fast moving scenes like action scenes. And some of the action scenes have a lot of individual elements, and the editing means you never really lose track of them. It keeps more calm when that is called for. I'm not sure there are really scenes that should be cut, moved in the overall structure, trimmed down or increased in length I would say everything is like every scene is long enough that it lands it has an effect you know a few months months ago I was talking about ah let me think what was it called again office space which you know you can tell that once they got to the editing some of that movie they they realize this this really doesn't work we're just gonna have to rush through it and yeah I I'm not sure I would really say that's the case here there are a few things I know were edited out but nothing that sh like nothing that breaks the movie by being edited out And, right, quoting a fellow critic here, Lucas has once again recycled the B-movies of his youth. Jungle movies, gangster movies, pirate movies, you name it. He culls bits from them that still have oomph and mounts them with a Sesame Street zap. The animation is quite good, and they do a good job using different kinds of animation, again, and in, you know special effects in general they they use a good variety of them and ah, what's the word the a lot of them have aged fairly well there's some really solid stop motion work in this there's 
especially there's there's one creature in particular that's done via stop motion and apparently they were actually considering taking a page out of Godzilla movies and trying to do it with a person in a suit thankfully they realized before they committed to that that it simply wouldn't look completely convincing and so they opted for stop motion and yeah it it looks really really convincing like it has the stiffness to it that i I've, I've watched dozens maybe over a hundred movies that have stop motion i wish i could claim otherwise but there is a certain stiffness and awkward movement to it that you know once you get once you realize that there, there, that that is a specific kind of thing, then you get really good at spotting it. Cause, yeah, it's just it's really difficult. You know, it's it's like with, you know, some CGI can be kind of weightless, but by today you can do completely seamless CGI, but stop motion i've seen some movies where they cleaned up the stop motion they they helped it with later effects and it was still you could still tell that there was something there so but it still looks really good in my opinion some of the chroma key is way too obvious and i don't mean that compared i don't mean compared to today i mean compared to the first two movies a lot of model shots in the first two released hold up better I don't think there's as much like I oof, what's the word the the special effects are not that much better from the, the episodes 4 and 5 some of them are some of them are really great but a number of them just they're not that hugely they're not huge upgrades compared to the first two. So the budget was between $32.5 million and $42.7 million. And the box office was $475 million. So yeah, it, it did well. There's some really great production design. Job of the Hutt's Palace is glorious. It really does look like something that a mob boss would live in in this universe. And according to Wikipedia, the, the filming schedule was six weeks shorter than Empire Strikes Back. Kassanjian's sh schedule pushed shooting as early as possible in order to give Industrial Light and Magic Island as much time as possible to work on effects, and left some crew members dubious of their ability to be fully prepared for the shoot. Again, I think that might be part of, that might help explain some of the issues with the movie. And different parts, some, some were shot in England, some in America. And the Emperor's Throne room, thr room is very ominous looking. And I don't think there are enough new places. You know, some, some places and ideas are revisited and redone. More desert, more swamp. Right. I, according to IMDb Trivia, the job of the Hutt puppet took Stuart's Reborn's team three months to build, cost half a million dollars to make, and weighed 2,000 pounds. Ten puppeteers, nine mime artists, 42 extras, and 18 principals, supported by a crew of 90, worked almost a month on the Jabba's Palace sequence. Their effort really shows. And talent. And the radiating shafts making up the floor of the second Death Star's reactor core are actually 1,500 fishing rods. And 
as far as costumes go, a number of the military outfits, you know, have memorable looking uniforms that fit the surroundings well. And we get a handful of new creatures, several of which are at least one of the following irritating, more or less poorly realized visually, and too cute. And designs aren't that imaginative for a few of them. One of my problems with this is that it does not bring in enough new ideas. The evil Galactic Empire have a Death Star, a space station powerful enough to destroy an entire planet at a time. They did in A New Hope as well, and that one was destroyed. Why would we doubt this one being destroyed? And the Luke Skywalker may turn evil and join the dark side tension, I feel in a number of ways was more compelling in Empire Strikes Back, especially in the cave and, you know, Yoda's attempt to talk Luke out of flying to Bespin. I heard someone say that the movie is simply too big, has too many special effects, tries for too many big scenes. And it gets exhausting and or starts to self-sabotage. I think there might be at least a little bit too much. Yeah. The, the action works pretty well, especially some of the first scenes and some of the last scenes. And, you know, among the, the types of action scenes, we have chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights, martial arts, shooting, including shooting while in vehicles. Luke uses force powers and lightsaber in multiple action scenes for the first time in the trilogy. Mind you, I'm not saying there was a lot of room for that in the first two, but they did make the active decision to include more of it in this, and the movie's better for it. And quoting a fellow critic, famous for being the weakest of the original trilogy films, but with the best space battle of the three. And yeah, we have yet another Star Wars original trilogy movie. So we of course have yet another scene where an outer space monster is trying to kill someone. And very likely going to try to eat them. I'm not complaining. I, that's... Yeah, I quite like that that's in these. The music is, again, incredible. Once again, done by John Williams. That's actually, you know, in my old review, that's one of the few things that I praise, is that the music is so magnificent. So, at Jabba's palace, an alien sings a song in this sort of R&B style. It's soul-crushing to watch. Fast forward through it. The moment you see it start, you will not miss anything. So yeah, I did forget about that earlier in this video when I said not to fast forward. Now... The slithery noises made when Jabba the Hutt moves were created by sound designer Ben Burt running his hands through a cheese casserole. And speeder bike pass by sound effects were done by splicing together thunder sounds with those of a P 38 airplane. And Darth Vader's footsteps were recorded in underground tunnels by the Golden Gate Bridge to help create an ominous effect. The Sarlacc sounds are a combination of alligator hisses and the sounds made by the crew while eating pizza. And yeah, some of the sound design is kind of uninspired. 
something that is pretty cool is that let's see I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and guess that it's pronounced Nian Nun he's one of the pilots in the, the movie and he speaks in a Kenyan dialect called Haya and yeah, they were delivered by a Kenyan. Okay, I want to try Kipsan Rotish, a Kenyan student living in the U.S., and they're actually correct high end tra translations of the English text. Audiences in Kenya were reportedly very thrilled to hear the language spoken in proper context. Several Ewok lines are in the Filipino Tagalog language. Most Ewok la lines, however, were inspired by the Kalmyk language spoken by Buddhist tribes living in southern Russia. And the Ewok language was based on Tibetan. Actually, I guess that's... Is that the Buddhist? Anyway. And... Yeah, so... When it comes to comedy, there's too much goofy, child-friendly, silly stuff in this movie. I'm not saying it's like the majority of the movie. I'm saying where the other movies would have a few elements of certain scenes be silly, this movie has entire scenes that are largely only silly. And worst of all, some of this movie is silly when it should be something we should that we could be taking seriously. There's at least one action scene in the movie that's supposed to be an important battle, battle, but there's so much silly stuff in it that it's hard not to cringe and much harder to feel emotionally invested in it. I mean, I guess small children laugh at the scene, and that's probably why it is the way it is, but that sucks for the rest of us. Rod Hilton of the film criticism comedy website The Editing Room, via his debridged script for this film, appears to assert his honest belief that these movies are made for children. I could imagine that that might be the case, but the first two movies you could show to anyone of any age and there will be something in there for them that the rest of the movie doesn't ruin and in this movie some of the childish stuff does ruin certain parts of the movie and yeah there, there are points of this where it seems like George Lucas forgot he wasn't writing a script for Indiana Jones. There are some very dark aspects to the movie. I think a little bit of their impact is stripped because of the fuzzy and cute aspects of the movie. It does do a good job with setup and payoff and increasing the tension and threat. In multiple scenes, details will be at the start of the notes taken before watching section. Quoting fellow critics here, Cuteness is the watchword here. The dark, eerie atmosphere that oozed from every frame of Empire Strikes Back is gone. Instead, for Return of the Jedi, we have good, triumphing, decisively over here on a two-path resolution to a love triangle and walking teddy bears. Brings things to an almost cheesy conclusion. Given the gripping dark elements that creator George Lucas introduced in the two previous films, the third movie outcome third movie's outcome smacks of PG-rated populism rather than artistic fulfillment, but the experience is still highly entertaining. All the parts of Return that deal with Luke's faith in his father and his appeals for him to reject the dark side of the Force are very emotional. In fact, the best sections of Return are extensions of the melancholy implications of Empire Strikes Back. So, uh, that brings us to the pacing. Doug Walker says that the movie has too many detours. Rescuing Han Solo takes up too much of the movie and is not, it, it did, did not have to be in the movie, but the Emperor, the parts of the movie that focus on him are excellent. Cosmonaut Variety Hour says that in Return of the Jedi, the Empire isn't really actively fighting to stop the Rebellion, or maybe it just doesn't really feel like they are the way that, you know, A New Hope and especially Empire Strikes Back do. The movie's over two hours long, and that's right, he thought, 
he's entitled to his opinion. He felt that there are, there's a maximum of 30 minutes of it that are good. I, I would say there's significantly more of than, than of it that's good than that. But anyway, parts of the climax are amazing. Others are excruciating. And yeah, quoting fellow critics here, unfortunately it conveys the sense that the machinery has already started to wear down and the inventiveness to wear thin. To be sure, the film abounds in action. Some new peril besets Luke Skywalker hunts all over the Princess Leia almost too regularly every 10 minutes, but there's a kind of desperation about it, a feeling that Lucas and co-writer Lawrence Kasdan are simply trying to figure out what they can do next to amuse the kiddies. The stuff of legend that inspired and elevated the earlier episodes has here been replaced largely by the stuff of comic books. The following was written by Pauline Kale, word assassin and movie critic. This is an impersonal and rather junky piece of movie making. It's packed with torture scenes and it bangs away at you. And every time there's a possibility of a dramatic climax, a chance to engage the audience emotionally with something awesome, the director Richard Marquand trashes it. Return of the Jedi doesn't really end the trilogy as much as it brings it to a dead stop. The film is by far the dimmest adventure of the lot. There's hardly any point in discussing the direction of a picture like this, in which almost every shot has been predetermined by the requirements of the special effects. Yet director Richard Marquand fluffs the two or three real opportunities he has, rendering the long-delayed character climaxes with a chilly indifference. Yeah, I do think the character climaxes could have been more compelling. Ah, my, my back. I think I need to move quicker, so I will. For all the issues this film has, there is still some amazing stuff, some of the best ever. If the film could just tune out the lame stuff and pace itself better, this could have been the best of the series, arguably. Instead, this is the least of the trilogy, as even the first one didn't have any real issues. Still impressive, though, the trilogy could have a solid run all the way through. So the movie is two hours and eight minutes long without end credits. Two hours, fourteen and a half minutes long with them. It is just barely worth the investment of time, at least once. If you're not interested 30 minutes in, the movie probably isn't your kind of thing. Certain parts of it feel much longer than they are. And, I, yeah, I would trim the Ewok scenes personally. The movie definitely has a progressive message. The evil galactic empire are a bunch of old white dudes who destroy and conquer using their superior technology. The good guys rebel against the totalitarian rule. They're made up of a diverse group. You might say that anyone can be a rebel. It's not about where you came from. It's about what you believe. While, once again, if you're not a white man, you can't work for the empire. If you're not old, you only have a low position in their military. And the good guys do not purely rely on technology. So the best element of the movie is some of the darker stuff. And the worst aspect that is that although it does conclude the trilogy in certain ways, it does not do so in a satisfying way. Ultimately, I don't think it's that big of a deal. And if you go into the movie knowing, you know, if you're... If you mentally prepare yourself, then, yeah. The worst aspect, according to others, is that too much of it is silly. So I was most worried that it would not live up to the amazing buildup of Empire Strikes Back. Ultimately, the movie lived down to my expectations. To be fair, it's easier to build something up than it is to deliver on it. I was most looking forward to seeing Luke as a Jedi Knight, and the movie lived up to my expectations. Now, most of the movie is entertaining. 
the trailers give away do give away too much, but they do also give a pretty good idea of what the movie is like. If you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if not. The cover and poster do not give too much away, and if you like the poster or cover, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not. And so I have a short list of big problems with the movie that I can only detail by going to spoilers, and I will do so in the notes taken before watching section. So on Rotten Tomatoes, this has this has an eighty-two percent on the tomato meter based on ninety-six reviews and ninety-four percent audience score based on two hundred fifty thousand rating or more than that. Yeah, right. And of the ninety-six reviews, seventy-nine of them are fresh. And. The movie is certified fresh because there are so many reviews and so many of them are positive. And the meta, meta rating on Metacritic is 58 out of 100. The user rating on Metacritic is 8.3. And there are 24 Metacritic reviews, 246 Metacritic user reviews. On IMDb, it has 88.3 out of 10, based on 983,795 IMDb user votes. And, yeah, so 29% gave it 8, 24.9 gave it 9, 22.4 gave it 10, and the rest of the numbers are fairly low. The violence and gore are mild to moderate in amount and intensity. Overall, I would personally say it's probably closer to an R rating than a PG in some areas. Let's see. It is a decent, you know, the amount of violence is enough to make the world feel dangerous, not so much that it gets tedious or numbing. The, the sexual material in the movie is completely unnecessary, especially because the sexual women tend to be there for male entertainment, sending the message that sex is something men take from women. And I, I mean, I guess maybe it was there because they were worried that not enough adults, not, not enough male teenagers and adults would watch without it. Overall, I'm not sure that the, the, the violence itself, I guess maybe toned down a little bit, but I wouldn't, like if you're thinking about showing this to a child, you know, I would say maybe, I'm not sure I would show it to someone who was less than nine years old, but yeah, from, from that age up. Sure. And yeah, so this is not capital C cinema. It is basically cinematic junk food. And yeah. If you haven't watched A New Hope and Empire, if you have watched A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back and you haven't watched this yet, then obviously you're going to want to know how it ends since Empire Strikes Back ends on such a cliffhanger. As long as you adjust your expectations, I would say ultimately, you know, yeah, you'll get a decent amount of enjoyment out of watching this. Then, let's see, yeah. And on the, on Disney Plus, you know, Disney Plus is every single Star Wars movie and all of the shows as well. As far as extra, you know, special features for this, it has about 22 minutes of deleted scenes. They're interesting enough viewing. You know, ultimately it's not a lot. Comparatively, most MCU movies have good stuff, and some of them have a ton of stuff. But, yeah, you know, if, if you're a fan of Star Wars, you don't already have access to the movies, you want to have access to the movies, 
Disney Plus does have a lot. So I give this seven final parts of a trilogy that try hard and some of the time really do succeed out of ten. And the kind of stuff that would have made me rate it higher would be if if the action scenes had just that tiny bit, yeah, were just a little bit more, like, intense and exciting and cool. If the creature designs, like, the, the uncreative creature designs had been revamped to be creative, I really don't think we needed so many anthropomorphized pigs and fish and teddy bears with no subversive Strassman in sight. It's, yeah, really all, like, yeah, most things related to the Ewoks, I would say, are, are pretty bad. But yeah, that is it for the review itself. That brings us to the first thoughts section. Entitled Thought section start disclaimers, and we are in spoiler territory. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of it's very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section, when I, once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. So. From here on out, I will no longer be warning for spoilers for this movie. I will warn if I spoil anything other than this movie or episodes 4 and 5. Now, I do think that this does, like, see, you know, as far as sequel, you know, yeah. I don't think it complete. It, it doesn't do as well as it could have on this thing of, you know, Luke now knows that his own father is you know, the evil Darth Vader, he's, you know, but I do think they get a lot of really gr good dramatic stuff out of that. Like, there are decisions made where, like, when Luke is, you know, when he gives himself over and he says to the, these, you know, stormtroopers, there's no one else, you know, I'm the only rebel in this area. And he, you know, he's hoping that when he meets Vader, Vader will say, will will basically be like, yeah, you know, uh, he's, he's, I believe him, don't, don't investigate. But instead, he just coldly says, do the, you know, search for the others. And Luke is like visibly shocked. Like he really does think that he can redeem, or uh, yeah, that he can that that his father can redeem himself if he just you know yeah and it, it it resolves the love triangle although it's yeah i'll get more into the the reveal that luke and leia are sisters in the next in in the final spoiler section rather and yeah you know the the i i do think i'll it it does a lot to to finish off the story and to give satisfying conclusions to the characters and character arcs and such. So the rest of this video is not a review. It is a series of well thoughts, some analysis, some MSCCP riff tracks, and other jokes, especially jokes in the very next thought section. Time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And the section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. Which brings us to... So, this is where I usually try to ask, does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? 
it definitely does have some empathy for Vader. You know, he he expresses that he he used to have good in him. He acknowledges that, but he thinks it's just too late now. The movie does not have empathy for the Emperor. We are only supposed to hate him and think he is pure evil and just a, a monster, basically. I don't think the movie would have been as satisfying if the Emperor was redeemable. I do think that Vader being redeemable works well. And I, I think that it's... I, I like that we have a huge blockbuster that ends with the good guy refusing to kill someone who's done evil things. You know, not the main villain, but an antagonist who's done evil things, including to himself. And he says, no, that's not who I am, and you can't convince me that the person I was, you know, I was, I almost killed is as bad as you say that he is. You know, the Luke Skywalker wins by forgiving his father and appealing to the the goodness that his father still has. He doesn't win by, like, hitting someone really hard or, like, you know... And, and it's not the... It's not like the movie doesn't ever let him be just the the kind of cool you know very straightforward action hero he is when he deals with Jabba for example you know so yeah I I quite like and the, the movie was kind of setting up it it seemed like he was going to keep being cool throughout the movie but then yeah, when he deals with the Emperor, he finds that he cannot win by killing the Emperor. He can't... Yeah, I, I felt they did a, a good job on, on that. So... The... the I really wish this movie didn't put... Leia in a gold bikini. I know, I know. You know, type in your hate comments. I do appreciate that at least she, you know, she isn't in the movie only to be sexualized. But, I mean, she was a prisoner in the first movie as well, and temporarily in the second one too. It wasn't until this movie that she was put on display in a gold bikini, in a, this highly sexualized outfit. And there's some sexual assault as well. At least she does get to kill Jabba. She turns the chain of captivity into a lethal weapon. She would actually be less dangerous to Jabba if he hadn't chained her up. And, you know, again, she isn't just there for that. There is another... But, but yeah, and actually he specifically... In, in addition to just the chain limiting her freedom there's this bit where she if i recall she's like looking out the the window or something and he pulls her by the chain like painful clearly for her and she turns it against him so that's yeah and now i'm going to share with you something beautiful that carrie fisher once told a a, a fan I, I believe a male fan he asked her what am I supposed to tell my little daughter about you in that bikini? You can tell her that I was forced to put it on against my will, then I killed the slug who forced me to put it on and took it off in my trailer. I did have to recreate that from memory, so it's possible some of the details are a little off, but yeah, Carrie Fisher was awesome. Now, let's see, so the, the, and apparently, you know, the reason that Lucas, 
let's see. Yeah, in, in the first, in, in episodes four and five, George Lucas explained he wanted to set Leia apart from eye candy damsels in distress. He wanted Leia to be a bold leader who could be looked up to instead of sought after. And Carrie Fisher said that one could not tell that she was a woman, and that's apparently why the that's why they decided on the bikini. Now, the I, th I think the movie does a good job of not overexposing the various threats. Like, we never just become completely used to looking at the Rancor or the Sarlacc. Let's see, are there other big monsters in this? Based on how much time we spend seeing fairly clearly the Emperor's face, we should become just used to it, but somehow we don't. Maybe it's the, the performance, and the, yeah, it's, it's very compelling. And, you know, I'm not the first one to point out, it is basically, you know, it's like a witch. Old and, and like, unnatural skin and like, the, the, a lot of wrinkles and a voice that's, that's really creepy, you know. And the movie does a pretty decent job with suspense. My making jokes on this should not necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad. I simply find it very difficult not to MST3K and overanalyze everything I watch. And that brings us to the next section entitled Notes Taken While Watching. So one quick MST3K for Empire. I, you know, I rewatched it a few days ago, like I said, and I realized there was an MST3A I should have made. When Vader said, tells the Emperor, he's just a boy, I couldn't help but add, standing in front of a frog, asking him to train him. And that brings us to the, my comments on this particular movie. The movie immediately sets up the concept that you need security codes when you approach a vessel of the Empire. You know, the, the yeah, it, if you're if you're near the Death Star, you you know, there's there's the, the force field shield. They if you don't have a code, I forget is it supposed to like fry stuff that touches it, or is it just like a a barrier that you can't get through? I whatever, you know. The fact that you need codes like that becomes important later when the rebels have outdated codes. For all its faults, this movie does still have an epic introduction to Vader, although this is the first time, of, of the three movies, this is the first one where he isn't walking in right after a group of stormtroopers. Well, you know, checking in the in episode five, they, they were snow troopers, and then this. I guess does he ever come that close to any of the? I forget. Do they call them forest troopers? Maybe it's yeah. Holy crap! I completely forgot how massive the door between the desert and Jabba's palace is. What do they need to fit through that thing? The second Death Star? You know, the, they, that, this does really build tension and make Jabba and his whole operation seem tough and strong, making it more compelling when we see the good guys defeat it. Some viewers question why anyone would design a robot that can feel pain. There are at least the kinds of robots that we see tortured in Java's dungeon, you know. I mean, so that they could be tortured in case they displease their master. I mean, 
I agree that it's like it's cruel to design them like that. But I mean I think there are a number of cruel beings in the Star Wars universe that you know, for example, create droids. So, yeah. And you know, the the band finished the song and Jabba insists in Huttese, do it again. I mean, I know he's ruthless. I just don't know what the audience, has, what we in the audience have done to deserve the punishment of having to hear that song. Some people question why Leia posing as a bounty hunter demands more money for Chewbacca. I think it's to make a strong impression on Jabba. You know, you have to seem not too agreeable when you deal with some someone like that. Or they'll wonder if you have an ulterior motive for being there. You know, it makes... She she really comes across as being... You know... Like... She's, she's as ruthless and as... As tough as, as Jabba. And in fact, I mean, Jabba specifically says... I like that. You know, you, you made an impression. Actually, yeah, isn't that when he's... I think that's when he says, you can stay here for a while if you want to or something. If if the... I'm just, I'm, if Leia posing as a bounty hunter, bounty hunter was only there for a bounty, why wouldn't she just leave right after? But if Jabba the Hutt tells her, Stick around. I like you. Of course she's gonna, or she's, you know, if she was like, no, I'm, I'm gonna leave and just turn away and leave, she might screw up a, you know, potentially lucrative working relationship with him. And we already know that he has bounty hunters around. Boba Fett is still there, for example. I kind of agree that Lando pulling his mask down to reveal to the audience that he's posing as a guard is kind of awkward and clearly just for the audience's benefit, but at least C-3PO doesn't feel the need to state the obvious like he did when we were shown Han Solo and Carbonite for the first time in this movie. I can't see. Spoonie, open your eyes. And, you know, uh, Leia has just freed... Han, and Han is still like, he can't see completely, so he hears someone going, ho, ho, ho. Who's that? Santa? Really epic introduction to Luke with the light behind him walking in, dressed in black. We don't know exactly what he did or said to get them to open the door, but I'm guessing he used a Jedi mind trick since we see him do that not very long after this, and they wanted... They, they wanted us to see him walk in like that. They didn't want to show him doing a mind trick. Since, you know, it's an easy... What, what's the... It's easy to deduce that that's what happened. I must be allowed to speak. This is a free speech issue. Just to be clear, I'm not saying... Free speech is important. I'm just... I'm making fun of people who misuse the idea of free speech to basically try to get away with being jerks. And Luke is casually using mind tricks just like we saw Ben do, so it's telling us that he's at that level now. And the Rancor is revealed. At this movie, at this point, the movie is about 20% large gates opening and closing. The pig guard even squeals like a pig. This is a franchise that has been so creative with its sound design up to this point and now we just have anthropomorphized pigs squealing like pigs. I appreciate that not everything Luke tries when fighting the Rancor works. Like he tries to like, you know, if this is the Rancor's mouth, he like stuffs a bone in there thinking, oh, then it won't be able to close his mouth. It'll no longer be so dangerous, but it just, you know, so yeah. Luke defeats the Rancor. I'm sorry to tell you this, pal, but this is a gated community. 
I wish I had your confidence. Mm, you'll you'll catch on. So I've seen the Sarlacc pit. I've I've seen both the version with the mouth sticking out, and I've seen where it's just like the big pit, and you don't see. You know, I prefer the pit. I think it's more. Yeah. And Java asks them to beg for their lives, and Luke is, and Luke just goes. This is your last chance. Free us or die. Badass good guy. Hi, Boba. Bye, Boba. Yeah, it's... I, I'm not one of the people who worship Boba Fett, but... It's wild to me that George Lucas had so little of an idea of how big a deal he was to fans. And just kills him off like that. Even with a burp joke, which, even with how popular Boba has become, that burp joke wasn't, like, immediately removed from, like, it's, anyway. So, apparently, Leia killing Jabba is a Godfather reference. So, I mean, I'm hoping the idea is that's a reference only meant for the adults to understand, but, yeah. I really appreciate that not everything goes perfectly when Luke starts fighting back against Jabba and his forces. Lando falls, falls off and is hanging. Then the platform thing gets hit and starts like tilting. It's it's been a while. Uh, what what are you supposed to do with the the pinball machine when it's when it tilt? Anyway, I'll, I'll look it up later. And Jabba's barge is completely destroyed. Massive fireball explosion. A satisfying conclusion to that whole storyline which has been going on since A New Hope and it is like there were a lot of beings on that thing and they were evil you know they they worked for and or with Jabba the Hutt but Jabba the Hutt laughs the Emperor laughs the villains of this movie are just a real jolly bunch Yoda's death is treated with appropriate weight, and they do a pretty good job on the effect of the sheet covering him slowly lowering after he fades out of existence. Like, you know, realistically, like, they had, you know, they, they had to film that the, the sheet was at the normal, at the height that you would expect from Yoda still being there, but without the, the Yoda puppet there. I mean, I'm guessing maybe they had, like, a stick holding it up, and then they lowered the stick so it slowly... Yeah, some, something like that. Leia. Leia is my sister. Your insight serves you well. Better than the script does, anyway. The nearby forest moon of Endor. I have heard so many people argue if that means that the the forest moon itself is called Endor, or if it's the moon of the planet Endor, yeah. For the time, the effect on the the effects on the speeder bikes is pretty good, but it just hasn't aged as well as the model shots. I'm not saying they could have done better when they were making the film. I'm saying they should have acknowledged the quality of the effects and simply relied less heavily on it. Just a few seconds instead of, I mean, as it is, I don't know, maybe a minute or more of screen time of just the fast moving through the, the forest, the, the, those shots, and just, yeah, it's, it's always stuck out to me. I do appreciate that as soon as that one stormtrooper has a good shot at Leia, he does start firing. A, you know at her with a pistol like he he's not like wasting a lot of opportunities for a while he does not have a good shot on uh, yeah Luke and the storm tro storm trooper both bump into each other's speeder bikes well someone watch Ben her so the Ewoks see that C-3PO is golden, so they assume that he's wealthy and start worshipping him immediately when they become aware of his, his existence. So clearly they are Republicans. The chant 
that the Ewoks do to worship C-3PO is pleasant to listen to, at least. I think it would make good ASMR. The Force is strong in my family. That and the ability to incredibly quickly deduce the fact that my sister is Leia. Seriously, Luke, Leia, Vader, all of them very quickly realize that Leia is Luke's sister upon being told, or in Vader's case, realizing from reading Luke's emotions that he has a sister. Now that I think about it, wait, did Vader realize that Leia was his sister? And anyway, even without that, it is still... Both Luke and Leia immediately jump to, oh, so we're twins. That's why you won't bring me to the Emperor now. See, Luke knows that even an adult child might still be able to guilt trip his father. You don't know the power of the dark side. If I told you how many volts it was, you would not believe me. The Emperor will show you the way, the true ways of the dark side. He is your master now. Isn't Luke a little old to be given up for adoption? And Luke tries to intimidate the Emperor the same way he tried with Jabba, but where with Jabba he was right, here it is immediately undercut by the Emperor knowing about the rebel attack and it being a trap. So great contrast there, expectation subversion, like Luke throughout this movie has had a fairly easy time getting out of situations but here it really I mean that is essentially that is part of the reason that he was willing to give himself up you know he figured I can do this I can get Darth Vader to to help me and now it's you know it is not going well and the the let's see you know, you also see the shock on Luke's face when, you know, at first, like when he just says, pretty soon, all of, you know, all three of us will be dead. He's basically hoping, he's, he's kind of expecting the Emperor to have the same reaction as Jabba, just like di disbelief. But instead, he knows, he knew exactly, and he in fact was hoping for that, like, the, the Emperor was basically like sitting there, please, please tell me, tell me that you're going to defeat me. I'm, oof, it would be so good. I have, I have such a great line to reply to you. I get the reason Han attacks the Imperial officer after they are caught. You know, it's, it's because the filmmakers are scared that we'd be thinking Han was weak for not fighting back. But it just makes me wonder why the Imperial troops don't shoot them on the spot figuring that Han will keep attacking. Fire at will, Commander. What did Will do to you? We expect R2-D2 to be the one to save them at the panel, but then Han has to... You know, yeah, another expectation subversion. And you kind of expect maybe the good guys will lose this time due to all these setbacks. Very satisfying when Chewie and the Ewoks in the Chicken Walker manage to destroy another Chicken Walker and shoot some Stormtroopers. I've always thought that it was pretty wild that they managed to fit... They, they managed to find enough open ground for... Okay, it's only one, but even one of the AT-80s. or Imperial Walkers. And we realize, you know, Leia's pretending that she got badly hurt so that she would get a good shot at the other Stormtroopers. Very clever. Han and the others worry that the Chicken Walker will attack them, but then Chewie pops out. Obi-Wan has taught you well. Chopped liver, am I? Yeah, yeah, it's a little off. I know, I haven't been practicing it for a little while.
Darth Vader throws his lightsaber once and launched a thousand game developers into a foolish quest to make lightsaber throwing a major part of gameplay in multiple Jedi Knight games. I love that game series, but seriously, I've always found it incredibly... Sabers are for fencing, not throwing. Look at those, look at how happy those Imperial officers are to hear that the rebels are fleeing. Just huge smiles on their faces. You know, they say that if you love your work, you never work a day in your life. And they are wrong, that is not the case. So be it, Jedi. And the Emperor starts zapping him. Is Jedi slang for rechargeable battery in his language or something? You will pay the price for your lack of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying not to do the... I, I'm a little worried that the the my my Emperor impersonation is as, as wonky as my Yoda. Okay, I'll try. You will pay the price for your lack of vision. That is true. Glasses can be very expensive. And the Rebels flying through the Death Star is legitimately very cool. And it's a good... like. I really appreciate that it's not just another trench run like we got in, in in A New Hope, which was great at the time, and the style at the time, but by this point, okay, let's show something. We've seen that, you know. It's it's really cool, like these, this really intricate, yeah, you know, involved, complex innards of the the... Death Star. That's I, I quite like that. As much as I love the name Super Star Destroyer, here near the end, I think it's Admiral Akbar who says the name fast. He says Super Star Destroyer. So like a paparazzi is that? What you... Tell your sister your dad needs some alone time with Uncle Bot. Okay. Seriously, he sounds drunk, out of his mind, slurring his words. I think the idea is, it's like some of the, the robot stuff is like affecting... Anyway. So Leia has just told Han that she loves Luke. And Han says, well, stay out of the way. It's not like that. He's my brother. And Han spends like a second thinking, they're not from Alabama, right? And then he's relieved and quite happy. So... Hayden Christensen appears as Anakin Skywalker as a ghost here at the very end. I think the actor has done incredible acting in other roles. I, you know, I've watched Shattered Glass multiple times. I think his performance is incredible. He's explained that his performance as a ghost here at the end would have been different if he better understood what Lucas was going to use the shot for. And I can imagine. I've basically already said I don't think he gives that good of a performance in the prequels. It just seems wrong to take it away from the actor playing old Anakin in this movie. It seems like he redeemed himself here at the end, so why isn't he the one who appears as a ghost, which originally he did you know it seems like the decision was made primarily in the interest of synergy and it would have been better the other way around and that brings us to the final section notes taken before watching so i've said a lot of negative things and i you know i stand by them but I do want to highlight some positives as well. It's a cool twist that the Death Star is ready for use and shoots rebel ships. I do feel like the movie kind of cheats because didn't they already say that it wasn't done? I guess it's supposed to have gotten done in the time that the you know the good guys were rescuing Han and then getting around yeah getting to the yeah, anyway, as I say in the review, the movie does legitimately do a good job with setup and payoff and increasing the tension and threat in multiple scenes. In Jabba's palace, we see that Jabba is perfectly happy to sacrifice his slave girls, so we know that Leia is potentially in a lot of trouble there. 
The slave girl dropping down the trapdoor tells us it's dangerous when Luke steps on it, so we feel increased fear for him when when he does. And we don't actually see exactly what happens to the slave girl. We just know that it must be bad, so we're we're thinking, you know, even the first time you watch it, unless you're like nine years old, you probably guess we're gonna see what happened. We're we're gonna see what happens to people who fall down that thing later. But yeah, it builds it up pretty well. And the, you know, the Rancor delivers. And, you know, having having the, the trap door right in front of, like, it's right in front of Jabba. So if you're addressing Jabba, you are in danger there. Who's going to be gutsy enough to go in there and not stand facing Jabba like that while talking to him. And we don't see, you know, and, and it's actually also like the, the you know, hypothetically, the, there's also, you know, there are guards and bounty hunters in there. So even if someone like tried to threaten Jabba and not stand on the, the uh, trap door, you know, it would still be a problem. It, there would still be a threat to them. And near the end of the movie, it is revealed not only did the Emperor know about the rebel attack, he planned. He, you know, he want, yeah, he planned it. He wanted them there so he could kill them, get them all killed off at once. So Luke is standing in front of the Emperor, and he and we are being told all of his friends are about to die, and they won't even get anything out of it like it won't be a period victory they will die and lose and you know what happened last time luke believed that his friends were in danger you know this is the this is a moment where luke can prove that he really is more emotionally mature and he is better he is more in control of his emotions which is something that your jedi are expected to be than at the end of Empire Strikes Back. I really appreciate that Luke uses guerrilla tactics against the Rancor. He doesn't just easily defeat it with the Force. Like, how boring would it be if he just, like, held up a hand and Force choked it to death or something? I appreciate how the Emperor is first defeated spiritually when Luke refuses to give in to his anger and fall to the dark side, and then physically when Vader redeems himself. I've heard some people say it was naive of the Emperor to think that Vader would just keep allowing to, to him to torture Vader's son. I mean, the thing we have to remember is that for many years now, Vader has followed the Emperor's commands to the letter. And the Emperor loses his temper when because he legitimately believes that his plan would work. He thought that he would be able to get a new extremely powerful Jedi and take from the rebels one of their most powerful weapons. When his plan fails, the Emperor, like many other weak people before and after, resorts to petty vindictive violence. Him using Force Lightning is pure sadism. He's not trying to kill Luke. If you want to do that, he just knock him down the shaft that he's right next to, or pick up a saber or something. No, he wants him to suffer. And torture of his son is not something that Vader is prepared to accept. When our heroes are captured, C-3PO says that it is against his programming to impersonate a god. Some people ask why. Here's my answer. As the pop culture detective points out, droids in Star Wars are slaves. He does a great job arguing why he makes that claim. So if you are not yet convinced of the truth of that claim, go watch his video on the matter. I would not be able to do as good a job as he does. People who keep slaves do everything in their power to prevent their slaves from ever gaining their freedom. If a slave convinced someone that they were a god, the person or people they convinced might be willing to fight to free that slave. Ultimately, Luke is able to convince C-3PO to do it. C-3PO has gone against his programming a number of times in these movies. He's become an ally of freedom fighters when he was originally just made to translate and be a butler. And 
Right. This is IMDb Trivia. According to Ian McDermott, George Lucas originally cast him simply as the physical performance of the Emperor, similar to David Prowse as Darth Vader. This became evident to him when a producer told him that if he was able to get his voice close enough to Clive Revels, who portrayed the Emperor's voice in Star Wars Episode V, Emperor Strikes Back, Lucas would, allow, would let him use his on-camera vocals in the final cut of the movie. However, McDermott felt he could conduct a stronger, more wicked and demonic voice for the Emperor, as opposed to Revel's more aristocratic Emperor. Lucas and even Steven Spielberg were so impressed with this take that it ended up becoming a signature trait of the character. The Emperor's chair was mechanized so that it could rotate when the scene called for it. However, the mechanism never worked properly, so Ian McDermott had to make it move by shuffling his feet. A piece of tape on the floor told him when to stop so that it would not be visible to the camera. So, if this is the floor, and these are Ian McDermott's feet, you know, so he he wants to get the 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 yeah, and this is this is the chair moving. He would have to like do this kind of thing, or like like push off until they would. Re That's hilarious. That's incredible. And now I can't unsee that. I I tried to see, but no, they they you know it is not visible on camera. It's visible to the camera, but that is that is amazing. You know, see, in some ways, he's just like us. I, when I was a kid, I, I shuffled my feet to, to spin on a chair. Now, let's see. Right. More IMDb trivia, the point of view shots for the speeder bike sequence were achieved by having a camera operator with a steady cam walk through the forest at normal speed with the camera filming at one frame per second. When the footage was played back at 24 frames per second, it gave the appearance of flying through the forest at high speed. So yeah, it was, it was a really good idea. And I do think that, you know, if they just relied on it less, anyway. The growls and sounds of the Rancor on Jabba's palace, palace were actually made by a dachshund. Yeah, here we go. Ian McDermott, a prolific stage actor, based his character's unusual voice on the Japanese method of using your stomach to project yourself. The result was a strange guttural croak that Lucas decided was perfect for the character of Palpatine. The raspy labored breathing heard from Darth Vader after he kills Palpatine was originally meant to be how his breathing sounded when he was first introduced in New A New Hope. The sound of his labored breathing was kept and used for this movie. I'm really glad that they only used it for this. He would not have been as compelling, as intense and intimidating a character. With that, now let's see. Yeah, the Rancor was originally supposed to be a stunt performer inside, the, inside a suit, a la Godzilla. Now... According to Wikipedia, Harrison Ford suggested that Han Solo be killed through self-sacrifice. Kazdan concurred, saying it should happen near the beginning of the third act to instill doubt as to whether the others would survive, but Lucas was vehemently against it and rejected the concept. And yeah, it was for toys, toy sales. Harrison Ford himself has agreed with this sentiment, saying that Lucas didn't see any future in dead Han toys. Now, 
the draws themes from the Hindu epic Bhagavad Gita. Mark Hamill pitched the idea of Luke donning Darth Vader's helmet after Vader's death, leaving the ending in Luke's character more ambiguous or ominous. George Lucas disagreed, opting for a happy ending. I'm not sure. I mean, the, the, they would have to rewrite some parts for that to be completely, but yeah, I think that could have been really cool. And yeah, so I already quoted some of the IMDb fact on why Kurtz did not produce, Gary Kurtz did not produce this. And yeah, he was particularly displeased with Lucas's decisions and Jedi to resurrect the Death Star and to change the plot line from one that ended on a bittersweet and poignant note to one having a euphoric ending where everyone was happy. He was probably referring to the originally scripted ending where Han Solo dies while destroying the Endor shield generator, and Luke's duel with Darth Vader leave, leaves him mentally broken, choosing to seek seclusion rather than celebrate the rebel victory over the Empire. Would have been very interesting, for sure. So, the plan to rescue Han, I'm not going to go over the steps much less the nonsensical nature of many of the steps of it. This is a little awkward. I try not to make plans for soon after I've recorded a vlog so that I don't end up having to rush through part of it so I can finish in time. But I do actually have a restaurant reservation two weeks from now, so there's simply no time for me to go through all of them. I'm kidding. That's actually one of the elements of the film where I feel like people are a little too hard on it. If you do want someone to go over the ways that they feel the the, the plan doesn't make sense, a number of people have done so in their videos focusing on this movie, including the Cosmonaut Variety Hour, the Screen Rant Pitch Meeting, but if you're new to the franchise, do note that video spoils the ending of Episode 3, Ruins of the Sith. It's been a while since I watched. I think CinemaSins also went over the steps. As far as I can tell, the plan kept changing. They had a plan. The plan failed. They made a new plan. And, you know, the, the yeah, the plan got increasing. The, the plans got worse and worse because they were... Oh, yeah, apologies for making the camera bounce. You know, basically, they ran out of good options. By the time Luke walks into Jabba's palace and tries to command him to hand over the droids... I'm going to move the camera a little bit. The framing... There we go. Yeah, tries to command him to give over the droids. You know, they have no one else left to send in. So I'll just briefly go through, as far as I can tell... Lando infiltrated Jabba's guard force, waited for a good opening, ultimately didn't find one, but stayed undercover while they worked through another plan. Leia legitimately expected that her bounty hunter act would culminate in her leaving with Han. Luke did think that Jabba would be willing to go give over Han and Leia for the droids. Or wait, yeah. Han for the droids. Because the Leia hadn't been captured when he sent in the droids, like you know, like I said, the plans are getting worse, and I figure Luke honestly thought that a Jedi mind trick would work on Jabba, since you know he saw it work on a stormtrooper in the first movie. Some people believe that the reason there's a lightsaber in R two D two is that that was part of the plan. I think Luke put in in there just in case, and like. You know, like, you know, C-3PO tells R2-D2, I wish I had your confidence. Not long before Luke, you know, bit, yeah, before R2-D2 shoots up the, the lightsaber and Luke is able to grab it. I think that was basically just like, I, I think Luke told R2-D2, 
if I end up in a really bad situation, if you can just be within, I don't know, is it 30 meters maybe, of me, I will signal you. If you get that signal, it means to shoot the lightsaber because I'll be able to jump up into the air and catch it. And then I'll be able to rescue us. So just sit tight, wait for my signal. And, you know, when he expresses confidence to C-3PO, he's thinking it's just a matter of time before Luke gives me the signal and we're, we're going to be fine. You know, and, the re you know, he has a reason to be confident. He's carrying a lightsaber. Luke is a Jedi, you know, I don't know if we want to go as far as calling him a Jedi Master, but he's he certainly, he's a much more powerful Jedi than, you know, so, yeah, I, I really, I don't think that it was, like, always the plan that they would end up in a situation where Luke would get the, the, the lightsaber from R2-D2. I think it was just in case. When Leia poses as a bounty hunter and demands more money for bringing in Chewbacca to Jabba, she threatens setting off a thermal detonator. Now, depending on which Star Wars video game you play, thermal detonators vary intensely in how big an explosion they cause. In Star Wars Dark Forces 2 Jedi Knight, it's a fairly small fireball explosion. In the Phantom Menace licensed video game released for PC and PlayStation 1, it is a massive explosion that covers most of the screen. Like, you can... It's been a while since I played it, but if I recall, that thing d d can destroy, like, one of the... Can destroy, like, tanks and massive amounts of droids and such. Now, one of the most hated aspects of this movie are the Ewoks. I was just having fun earlier. Look, I do not think that their presence is a big deal at all. I feel like people are blowing it way out of proportion. It's exactly what I would be saying if they had done the right thing and had them only be in the movie for maybe five minutes tops. And if they didn't somehow, with spears and wooden log traps, defeat the elite forces of the Empire. George, I know you set out to do the bare minimum with this movie. Bare minimum does not need mean that there has to be a minimum amount of bears. I do not want to hate them. I love when movies have nature defeat a force that relies too heavily on technology for war. I can't name examples without spoiling. You might already know what I'm spoiling. If you don't want any spoilers, yeah, mutant skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. I love it in Avatar. I love it in The Lord of the Rings. No more spoilers for the time being. In those movies, I absolutely love to see it. I wish I could say that for this movie as well. One thing that would help a lot is if instead of just spears, wooden log traps and such, if they actually had like homemade explosives and or maybe they had some ability that made chicken walkers blow up, that made stormtrooper rifles explode in their hands, more space magic would be hugely preferable in my opinion. I get that Lucas wanted there to be something cute in there, but why not have it be something that is cute looking, but actually good at fighting like Chewbacca is. Also, just because the Ewoks are small doesn't mean you have to make them cute looking. Plenty of horror movies have creepy kids that are small, but not even remotely cute looking. I think that would have been the better way to go. Maybe like cover their faces so you can sort of make out tiny creepy eyes. Obviously, you'd have to put some effort into making them distinct from the Jawas, but I do think something like that, yeah. Vader is like, maybe Leia can be turned to the dark side, so Luke, Luke goes beast mode on him. And I wish there was like an outtake where Vader was like, that came out wrong. Given the benefit of hindsight, maybe the way I should have phrased it, I am a Jedi, like my father before me. Why do kids always have to embarrass their parents on Take Your Child to Work Day? Obviously, we all hate that this movie retcons every single kiss between Luke and Leia to be incestuous. The thing that bothers me the most is not, that not a single character acknowledges that it's incest. Not Obi-Wan, not Luke, not Leia, not Han. No one. 
I wish that Endor was more interesting than just, you know, a forest. I realize not every American can just step outside of their own house and be within walking distance of a forest, but certainly we've seen forests in countless movies, including ones that are not sci-fi or fantasy. Seeing the desert in the first movie was very different from what a lot of people know, as well as the swamp in the second movie. You know, maybe they should just have saved one. They, they should have come up with more ideas and saved one of uh, yeah, save one of them for the final movie. So the first time I showed this movie to, oh, actually, hmm, is it this movie or is it Empire? Whatever, at least one of them. I showed it to my now ex-fiance, then at the time fiance. Darth Vader go, you know, asks, says to the Emperor, asks the Emperor, what is thy bidding, my master? And my ex-fiance, without skipping a beat, said, 5,000, not a cent more. Yeah. Very funny. Very, yeah. See, I'm trying to not, I, I'm not, I'm trying to, avoid, I, I don't want to, I don't want it to seem like I'm laughing at my own joke here. That's why I'm, yeah. Vader throwing the Emperor down the exhaust shaft after the Emperor told Luke to kill Vader and replace him was a real you can't fire me, I quit vibe. Has. I wonder how many Americans wish they could quit in that exact way. Dude tried to hire Vader's replacement right in front of him and fires him not only from the job, but tries to get Luke to fire him from life. Luckily for Vader, Luke is like, dude, my dad's not perfect, but that's going a little too far. I don't mind the, you know, there, there's that one bit where Leia is facing a stormtrooper and Wicket, is that his name? The Ewok hits that, that stormtrooper, like, on the leg, and the stormtrooper is distracted and Leia shoots him. That's, I, I think that's an okay as a, yeah. And the movie ends on the day the teddy bears have their picnic. I had honestly forgotten, yeah, how much of the fight between the Ewoks and the Stormtroopers actually has the Ewoks having trouble. I think maybe people forget that when they criticize, just, I do still think it's a problem, but, yeah, they, they don't, like, wipe the floor with them, at least not right away. And I've, I've heard some say that, you know, technically, the Ewoks don't win that fight, they help, and because of their help, they, it they're just barely able to defeat the you know imperial forces i think the movie should make that clear i think that is supposed to be the idea now that i just watched it and there's like a lot of them like you know you have ewoks trying to lose ropes to like trip over a chicken walker and the chicken walker just keeps walking and drags them with it which if it wasn't cute would be you know, it'd be like, oh, they're gonna have trouble, but instead, it's it's too cute for it. And there's that one that, like, flies, and he's got, like, this... I don't know exactly what it's made of, but he's made, like, a set of wings that he can, like, well, not fly, but float. And one of the stormtrooper... Uh, stormtrooper chicken walker, I forget. You know, one is, like, able to shoot and set fire to it, and, and he crashes, you know. So there's actually a lot of, of stuff like that, but... By the end, they have one, and I just don't think we see enough shots of not Ewoks defeating the, the Endor troops. Is, is, yeah. So, if there are actually any children watching this, don't go look this up before you're old enough. But part of the reason that Lucas used Ewok, let, had Ewoks help defeat you know, Imperial forces is the, yeah, Vietnam. And I get it. And, and that's part of why I say, well, then they should have something stronger. They shouldn't just be using, like, the way I, as, as far as I can tell, basically the traps that they had were largely for catching animals. You know, they had the, they had the net trap that works because, Chewy, like, he's like, uh, raw meat. The fact that it's hanging like that isn't suspicious at all and goes over and just, like, tries to chomp on it. <laughs> and everyone goes up, 
huh, raw meat just hanging. You know, if I didn't know any better, I'd swear this looks so much like a truck. Oh, Jude, don't touch it! You know, and then they all end up... Anyway, the... the yeah, you know, they have net traps that are... Really, I, I mean, maybe they do capture, like, Chewbacca-sized bears using a trap like that, for example. And, you know, the the they, they make large creatures trip with the with the ropes that they hold you know maybe if they're like attacking like a uh, uh, woolly mammoth or something it would be the first thing that pops in my head and and yeah they drop rocks on the the heads of again you know if you're there are certain animals that you could you know attack like that but seeing and and then you know in the movie they end up using it against these forces and yeah, the I, I think the implication is supposed to be they're not used to fighting a war, but that wasn't really the case in Vietnam. They were, you know, yeah, they were using guerrilla tactics and they were hugely under, uh, what's the, underestimated. They were hugely misunderestimated by the the military forces, but the yeah, it's just it's you. It, the two aren't equivalent enough, you know. I th I think actually one one. Is, uh, is that a spoiler? I guess technically that's a spoiler. There is at least one James Cameron movie where he also tries to draw a you know that kind of parallel. And I think he fares better because the the guerrilla forces are more convincing as being able to take on something that is more heavily armed and and has yeah than than they do you know but anyway that let's see, I think that's everything. That is, in fact, everything. So, if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two, or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which is currently What If? These days, the reviews and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you, want more, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.